one of our affiliation hospitals where the residents can improve their knowledge and skills. of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. Dr. Sutomo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. Dr. Sutomo Hospital, Faculty of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. The long and winding journey has been traversed by the faculty in its efforts to transform the knowledge in the field of medical science and devout science to improve the welfare of the nation, the state, and humanity.
Community Teaching Hospital is one of our affiliation hospitals where the residents can improve their knowledge and skills. Faculty of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. Dr. Sutomo Hospital is a public hospital owned by the government with most complete services in East Indonesia. In its development, Dr. Sutomo Hospital continues to develop Central Laboratory of Clinical Pathology. Clinical Pathology Department also has five divisions of subspecialization program established 2050. Other than that, provide solutions that can help maintain and overcome health problems until now. Halo, Anggur. Oh, masuk ya, Mbak. Oh, gue kan, Mbak, di sini, Mbak. Halo, Azul. Ya, masuk. Dengar ya suaranya? Hmm. Uh, kencang. Jelas. Jelas. Oke. Okay. Ini live YouTube ya, Mbak? Live YouTube, Masya Allah. Hmm. Azul, halo. Halo, ya. Kedengeran ya? Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Jadi prof pakai itu ya, pakai Masih sendiri mas. Ada sendiri ya. <tuh> Jadi mbak Fi pakai jadiin kok mas ya. Iya. Nanti yang nge-share anu tetap tetap mas dulu kan, yang nge-share ya, apa rundown sama cv-nya prof, eh cv-nya dokter Verdi. Bisa mas dulu. Saya, Mbak. <laughs> oh, ini CV Mbak YouTube ku itu. Jadi double suaranya, makanya aku bingung dengan ini ini. Bisa coba ya tak share ya. CV-nya ada tersebar di ya. Anu, rundown-nya dulu baru CV. Ya. 
aku akan bilang apa namanya uh, before we jump to the lecture please time to see the agenda for today itu nanti di share uh, apa namanya yang ini terus habis itu aku akan bilang uh, before we start our lecture please allow me to read the curriculum kita nah itu ini. baru ini ya yeah. terus habis itu uh, ladies and gentlemen please welcome dr Ferdi wes habis itu nanti saya akan stop share Uh -huh. Nanti Prof Naraja dijadikan co-host. Iya. Yeah. Co-host oh, aja. Bisa, bisa kok. Oh, Terus nanti kita siap-siap bikin -siap slide kanu. Setiap pertanyaan.
Assalamualaikum Prof. Nareza. Waalaikumsalam. Dr. Rufida ya. Uh, I am Tia Prof. Tia, alright. Yes, uh, please uh, wait for a moment ya Prof. Yeah, we wait for another participant join. Okay. Our Zoom. Thank sure. you Prof. Good afternoon, Prof. Naraza. Good afternoon, Dr. Ferdi. How are you? Oh, I'm so happy to see you again, Prof. Yeah, me too. Greetings from my, from my family. We oh, thank thank you, you for your help, especially for Michael's uh, for the last two years, Prof. I... I'm also very happy to, to see his picture, such a healthy boy now. <laughs> very healthy and uh, well, I think it's a miracle for us, Prof. Yes. How, how the COVID cases in Penang, Prof? Oh, COVID, um, yeah. it's increasing. The clusters are increasing again. Oh yeah, just the same with us. Now about two thousand cases a day, cases a day, new cases for the whole of Indonesia. Indonesia and last time three thousand yeah, three thousand cases oh. a day. That, that's that's not much compared to us. We have about four thousand. Oh, was well, still higher, probably. Yeah? yeah, it seems to go down. Oh. Then uh, increase last two days. Okay, last time I I got the case in May two thousand and twenty about five thousand yeah a day. Five thousand. Yeah, five thousand cases a day, and most of the cases um in KL right, bro? Um no. No, bro. Yeah. No, yeah, it's like uh, quite evenly distributed, uh, for example, in the northeastern part oh, of, okay. of Malaysia and then, you know, also in Penang. Hmm. So it's more distributed to all area, yeah, Prof? Yeah, yeah. In, uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, maybe Selangor and Kuala Lumpur the highest, but, yeah. you know, other states are... Uh, you know, catching up with some exception, of course. How about the Omicron cases, Prof? Um, mostly they are Omicron. Okay. And the fatality rate, is it uh, true that it is uh, lower than Delta? Um, well, uh, luckily, the fatality rate is low. Uh, uh, most of the cases are within the category 1 and 2. Okay. So it means they don't need any special treatment in the hospital, right? Yeah, they, they are either uh, no symptom or they have mild symptom. Oh, I see. Uh, 
But if they have fever or symptomatic, they have to be quarantined, especially those that come back from overseas. Yeah, I remember last time I went to uh, Selangor, they uh, quarantined us for seven days from in a hospital. We cannot go anywhere. We have a line actually. <laughs> If we if we walk through the line, they will give us penalty about thirty uh, million rupees in rupees. If I don't forget, about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very uh, rest, uh, strict, yeah, I think. But it is good for uh, for uh, yeah for control, yeah, bro. Is it also strict in Indonesia? Yeah, for the. A foreigner or even from Indonesians that come from uh, overseas, they also use the same criteria seven days. Prof. If uh, the patient had Omicron, they will uh, send the patient into the hospital for quarantine. Uh, we have Dr. Yeti, Dr. Yolanda, our uh, senior staff also, Prof, here. Yeah, Dr. Fahri, I'm in the bus. <laughs> I'm in the bus <laughs> on the way to Malioburo, Jakarta, and I, I get the permission of Prof Naraja. <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Yeti already in Georgia? Yeah, in Georgia, bro. For annual meeting of the university. You must be very busy. Yeah, bro. You must be very busy traveling. Yeah. All over. Uh, uh, I go by train and if the train just uh, on arrival and we move to the Bus, we transfer to the bus and we will go to the Mariupuru and then to, to, to the hotel. Wow. <laughs> yeah, now I am in the bus. <laughs> wow. I follow your uh, lecture. <laughs> Hopefully, success, yeah, Bob. Sorry? Hopefully, success. Ah, thank you. Uh, uh, same to you. Same, Jenny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I will close the camera from the video. Okay. We also had a participant from internal medicine. We have a staff here, Dr. Zaki, right?
Dr. Ferdi, can we start our lecture or should we wait for more participants? Okay. I think this uh, 1 p.m. Uh, jadi kita bisa mulai ya. I think we can start. Please, Dr. Thea, thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to expert lecture series in clinical pathology department. This webinar is organized by Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Airlangga, in collaboration with clinical pathology department. Uh, my name is Rovida. I am very delighted to have professors, doctors, and colleagues at this event today. Previously, we have met on Thursday on the first event of this expert lecture series. Today, we will continue the second lecture that will discuss about the genetics of hematological malignancies, which will be delivered by Professor Dr. Naraja, Master of Science, PhD. Before we jump to the lecture, please kindly see the agenda for today. Uh, this is the agenda for today. There would be a lecture from Professor Dr. Naraza, Master of Science, PhD, and we will continue with the discussion. Before we start our lecture, please allow me to read the curriculum vitae from Dr. Ferdi Roiland Marpaung, Clinical Pathology Consultant, as the moderator for today. Dr. Ferdi is a clinical pathology consultant in clinical chemistry. Dr. Ferdi is now the head of clinical chemistry division in clinical pathology department, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Erlangga, since 2020. Dr. Ferdi also the head of Indonesian Association for Clinical Chemistry, Surabaya. Dr. Ferdi is the doctor in charge for biomolecular laboratory in PHC Hospital and doctor in charge in Ramita Laboratory, Aditya Warman, Surabaya. Dr. Ferdi graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Sumatera Utara in 2005, graduated as a clinical pathologist in 2012, graduated as a clinical pathology consultant in 2021, and his interest was in clinical chemistry field. Dr. Ferdi also actively participates in several organizations, Dr. Freddy is a member of Indonesian Medical Doctor Association, member of Indonesian Association for Clinical Pathologists and Laboratory Medicine, member of Indonesian Association for Clinical Chemistry, and also member of INATA and for Almoni. Uh, Dr. Ferdi, please, time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ovida, for uh, the introduction. Uh, we are very happy and lucky to invite uh, Prof. Naraza again here as a lecturer in the topic of hematology, especially in, the, in today's topics. Prof. Naraza will talk about and discuss also about the genetics of hematology uh, malignancy. Shortly, please, Prof. Naraza, uh, the time is yours. Okay. All right, so thank you uh, to Dr. Rofida and also Dr. Ferdi, my good friend. Thank you for the introduction. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat petang kepada semua, Profesor-Profesor, Doktor-Doktor dan juga colleagues, tuan-puan dan uh, puan-puan sekalian. Ya. So, Dr. Ferdi, allow me to... Uh, proceed the lecture in, in English lah, all right? Please prof. All right. So I'll just uh, stop my video if you don't mind, then I will share the slides. Boleh nampak ya? Very okay. good. Okay, so um, 
uh, tajuk uh, sebelum tu juga terima kasihlah kepada organizing committee kerana jemputan pada hari ini sekali lagi so ladies and gentlemen uh, tuan puan sekalian uh, the topic of the second lecture today is the genetics of hematological malignancies okay so the outline of the lecture today is uh, uh, first uh, we're going to review the normal hematopoiesis and its uh, regulation and uh, next is let's let's look at the molecular basis of hematological malignancies uh, next is the use of uh, genetics of uh, hematological malignancies in diagnosis and classification of these diseases and then uh, I'm going to share uh, a little bit about uh, the data from Malaysia which has uh, recently been published regarding the genetic profiles and also risk uh, stratification in adult AML and lastly uh, just sharing uh, about uh, a little work of our uh, student about the gene expression biochemical and functional analysis of STEM1 gene or stromal interaction molecule 1 uh, gene uh, silencing in AML cell lines. Okay, um, cancer, uh, even though um, uh, cancer is a multi-step process and it's a form of genetic diseases. Even though it's a genetic disease, it doesn't mean that we can inherit cancer, even though some cancers are heritable, all right? So uh, if we, you, can, you can see from the slide here, it's a multi-step process, all right? Uh, the cells acquire a series of mutations and then after this series of mutation in the genes, uh, they become, uh, they have un, unrestrained or uncontrolled cell growth they, where they will divide. And then there's also inhibition of cell differentiation where the cells uh, remain at that particular uh, uh, early stage. And besides that, there is also uh, evasion of cell death. In other words, the cell do not uh, die as a, as a program or there is apoptosis. So besides all this uh, unrestrained cell growth and evasion of cell death, uh, the tumors will grow in size. Uh, once they grow in size, they will also stimulate a new blood vessel formation or angiogenesis and this new blood vessel formation uh, give the source or give the cells the cancer cells more nutrients and oxygen and the end result will, will be uh, exaggerated uh, proliferation and also evasion of cell death and on top of that if uh, the tumor cells are uncontrolled they will invade the surrounding tissues through a process we call metastasis. So they will, uh, you know, um, be uh, the, the, cell, the cells, the cancer cells will spread to other organs beside the primary uh, organ. Okay, um, the next few slides here uh, is um, I'm going to show about the number of uh, cancer cases, overall cancer cases. Uh, in Malaysia, where the data is gathered uh, from National Cancer Registry uh, from the year 2012 to, to 2016. This is the latest report from the National Cancer Registry. So if you look at the slide here, uh, if you look at the age uh, group on the vertical axis and the number of cases on the horizontal axis, we can see that you know, as a person age, as the age increases, uh, the number of cases of cancer also increase. So if we compare the age from zero to four onwards, the number of uh, cancer cases for this group is very low as compared to those in the age group 
starting from 60 years of age to 75 years of age onwards. Okay, so uh, the increase in the number of cases uh, show that it increases in age and is also uh, the same whether the patient is male or female. So the number of uh, cases or incidence of cancer case, cases increase, increase uh, in incidence as the age increases and is the same whether the patient is male or female. All right. So this uh, chart shows uh, age standardized incidence rate for 10 most common cancers of all residents in Malaysia, again from the Nas National Cancer Registry uh, data. So if you look at the age standardized rates for 100,000 population, we can see here that the most common cancer in the Malaysian population is breast cancer for females, right? And for the males is colorectal cancer, okay? And if you look at the hematological malignancy, uh, lymphoma, accounts for the uh, fourth most common cancer in the males and also in the females, okay? And uh, leukemia is less common as compared to lymphoma. All right, so this uh, subsequent slide shows uh, the common cancers among zero to 14 years of age group by sex. So if you look at the sites, uh, first in the male group uh, for uh, pediatric cases uh, range from 0 to 14 years. For the males, the most common cancer is leukemia, uh, followed by the brain, nervous system and lymphoma. Right? So leukemia accounts for 41.4% of leukemia cases in the males. Let's look in the females. It's also the same, but slightly lower. So for the females, uh, between 0 to 14 years, uh, leukemia is also the most common cancer uh, affecting the females. And as the age increases, it seems that uh, the site has changed where lymphoma uh, a common, com uh, commonly uh, affects the females now, all right? And also in the in, in the males and the females, lymphoma is also the most common cancer. All right, so it has changed. Uh, uh, in the earlier age group, leukemia is the most uh, common cancer, whereas as the child or as the, the person uh, grows older, between 15, 15 to 24 years of age, lymphoma becomes the most common cancer in the males and the females. All right, so what happens if the uh, age is increased. So between 25 to 59 years now, we see that uh, colorectal cancer is the most common in, uh, in the males and for the females, breast cancer is the most common cancer. So this is by age 25 to 59 years. So between 60 to 74 years as depicted in the picture below, uh, the most common cancer again is colorectal. All right, lymphoma is the fifth most common cancer. And then in the female is breast cancer and colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer. All right, so as, <coughs> as the age increases, the different uh, types or different sites of uh, cancer also change. We can see that leukemia affects most commonly in the younger age group, okay? All right, so if we talk about hematology cancers, uh, almost, uh, almost or automatically we will, you know, we have to revise and look back at the normal hemopoietic differentiation. So this slide shows the normal hemopoietic different, differentiation where uh, the blood cells, uh, uh, the origin of the, the blood cells, uh, whether it's in the myeloid uh, uh, system or the lymphoid system, where uh, uh, the, the origin is the pluripotent stem cell, all right? And then the pluripotent stem cell will divide into myeloid stem cell and also the lymphoid stem cell, 
All right. So uh, the myeloid stem cell will divide into their progenitor cells or colony forming units, which is CFUE, CFU megakaryocyte, and CFUGM. Right. And subsequently, they will uh, form precursor cells uh, where, you know, uh, for CFUE, they will uh, become pro-erythroblast reticulocytes and red blood cells. And the same for megakaryocyte, you know, uh, from megakaryoblast. And then uh, CFU, the, the colony for forming unit, units, uh, CFUGM, will differentiate into its subsequent uh, form elements of the circulating blood, which is the granulocytes, right? And on the other hand, we have the lymphoid stem cell, which are lymph T and B lymphocytes and uh, NK uh, natural killer cells, where they will, you know, subsequently uh, form the elements of the circulating blood, which is T B lymphocytes and, and NK cells. All right. So if you look at this picture, it is a tight control of all the elements of the form elements of the circulating blood. So the regulation of hematopoiesis. Uh, there should there is a balance between proliferation and differentiation of committed progenitors. So this uh, balance is to maintain the progenitor pool and ensure maturation in response to the physiological demand. So for example, during stress, uh, there are increased number of cells which require higher progenitor proliferation rates. And once, uh, the stress is overcome, there is a feedback mechanism which is closely coordinated. So this feedback mechanism serves as to repress progenitor proliferation and restore the physiological cell numbers when the stress is over, all right? And any, any, any uh, insult to this uh, regulation uh, will uh, cause uh, this balance uh, to be uh, affected and uh, the end result is a disease or pathological condition. So this regulation of hematopoiesis is very important. All right. So for lineage commitment in hematopoiesis, so what are those uh, controls? Among the controls are transcription factors, okay? These transcription factors are proteins. They play a very important role in hematopoiesis, whereby they regulate the hemopoietic stem cell early development, also for its survival and proliferation, and also lineage commitment. Uh, if we look at the example of T cells here, all right, uh, differenti differentiation of lineage committed progenitors. So Upon commitment to the lymphoid lineage, lymphocyte progenitors start their maturation in the bone marrow. So they either differentiate either as mature T cells in the thymus or mature B cells in the secondary lymphoid organs. And the lymphocyte fate is a tight regulation of mutually exclusive transcription factors and also signaling pathways. Okay, so these are the transcription factors uh, that uh, regulate the myelogranulocytic branch or myelomonocytic and the myeloid li uh, lineage transcription factors. So, you know, there are various group of transcription factors. Okay, so a group of transcription factors are important in the granulocytic branch of myelomonocytic commitment. So they uh, exert their action through cell, cell cycle arrest and upregulation of tissue specific genes. Also, a group of transcription factors which uh, comprise of GATA3, ICROS, ICAROS, for example, they are transcription factors. Uh, the hemopoietic stem cell gives rise to common lymphoid progenitors or CLP, where there is commitment of the lymphoid lineage. And also, there's a group of transcription factors which down regulate the myeloid lineage, such as uh, NFE2 and GATA1 GATA as well. Okay, so this is uh, another slide to show, you know, the lineage commitment in hematopoiesis, all right? So they provide a, a unique uh, gene expression program unique to hemopoietic stem cells. Okay, 
So what happens if it's uh, dysregulated? So there is different, differentiation block caused by dysfunctional transcription factors. For example, uh, a block in the terminal differentiation uh, plays a role in the development of leukemia. That's why we see immature, immature cells uh, uh, in, in patients with acute leukemia because there's a block of differentiation. Uh, reduction of the terminal differentiation, uh, uh, reduction of the terminal differentiation transcription factor, for example, PU1. So the outcome will be leukemia where there is failed differentiation and examples uh, whereby hematological malignancies arise from this uh, mechanism is translocation of T821 and T1517, where is the fusion, where is the where the fusion uh, proteins, uh, uh, AML runs one and PML rara. So this translocation uh, arises because of the failed uh, differentiation. All right and both inhibit the hematopoietic differentiation where there is uh, abnormal, uh, uh, there is a block terminal differentiation, all right? And the cells do not, uh, uh, do not uh, differentiate uh, to the major uh, cells uh, as it should be. So there is a block in the differentiation here. Uh, so this, uh, these are ideal examples due to translocation 821 and 1517. Okay, so this slide shows uh, the cell cycle, uh, the cell cycle disruption. The reason why I'm showing this uh, slide again is to show uh, where uh, it can be affected uh, by the disruption in the genes or aberration in the genes. For example, uh, as we talked last week, tumor suppressor genes uh, such as P53 or uh, retinoblastoma gene, it will disrupt the cell cycle at the S. -S and the G1 phase, okay? And then the oncogenes, for example, RAS and MIC uh, oncogenes, where it will, disrupt, it will disrupt the cell cycle at the particular phase. All right, so uh, we have actually uh, discussed uh, in detail. So just to recapitulate uh, our, our, what we have uh, covered last week. So uh, there are two classes of proteins in the cell division. Uh, the genes and the proteins are important for driving the cell cycle forward. And these are the proto-oncogenes. And uh, these uh, proto-oncogenes, uh, this is in the normal physiological function. So the action of these proto-oncogenes are uh, 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 controlled or anti proto-oncogenes uh, are controlled by tumor suppressor cells, all right? So as the name said, tumor suppressor cells, they are the genes and proteins which are important for restricting cell cycle progression. That means there's a balance between uh, uh, um, uh, the, the cell cycle and also uh, uh, there's a balance between the proto-oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes to maintain a balance. Okay, so why do we have to un understand all these molecular mechanisms, all right? So identifying the underlying deregul deregulation in hemopoietic malignancies, malignancies will give us uh, knowledge about the deregulation of the cell signaling signaling pathways because if there is a deregulation of the cell signaling pathways, there is a hyperproliferation which is uh, give rise to uh, increased uh, cell uh, synthesis or proliferation of the cells. Uh, the other reason to understand the molecular mechanism is because when there is a, a deregulation of the uh, of the pathways, there is also dysfunctional transcript, transcription factors. As we have seen earlier, uh, if the transcription factors are uh, dis dysfunction, there is a block in the differentiation, all right? So the other reason is sensitivity to the growth factors and also cell cycle dysfunction. Okay, so this slide actually shows the various uh, neoplastic hematological hematologic disorders. Uh, again, hematological uh, malignancies are 
are very, uh, you know, are, are very heterogeneous and very, uh, there are many types of hematological malignancies where it can either affect the myeloid or the lymphoid system, right? So for the myeloid system, we have uh, acute myeloid leukemia, uh, which uh, usually are comprised of cells that, that are immature. And uh, the other type is a, a mature or maturing uh, type of uh, hematologic, neoplastic hematologic disorders, uh, which uh, are comprised of myelodysplastic syndrome myeloproliferative neoplasm or uh, combined syndrome of myeloproliferative and myelodysplastic syndromes. <coughs> On the other aspect, we have the uh, neoplastic hematologic disorders, uh, which are in the lymphoid group. So we have the immature cell types, which are T cells and B cells, and also the mature cell types, which are T cells and NK cells, uh, which are examples of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And also we have the B-cell type uh, lymphoid disorder, which uh, is composed of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma, plasma cells, uh, plasma cells neoplasms, and immunodeficiency associated lymphoproliferative disorders. So this is the general uh, classification of the types of neoplastic hematology hematology disorders is very, very comprised of uh, big groups of diseases. Okay, so uh, a bit about uh, the, the, uh, the, the errors uh, that can happen uh, to the genomes of the hematological uh, diseases, all right? So there are two types of uh, genetic aberrations uh, that can uh, we can classify in a big group. One is uh, acquired genomic errors. This is more common or uh, affecting the somatic uh, cells. And the less common is the inherited abnormal gene uh, aberration. This is more rare compared to the acquired genomic errors. So what is uh, acquired genomic errors? It occurs during the normal cell function. It's uh, unrepaired physical or chemical uh, damage. Whereas uh, for the inherited or the germ, the germ uh, cell line uh, aberration, it results in increased susceptibility to hematological malignancies. Okay, so uh, pathophysiology of uh, uh, of the hematological diseases or these genetic mutations is thought uh, to be due to two types of mutations. So these two classes of mutations may be, may be acquired, which is also to, similar to ALL. So this is for AML. So uh, there, are, uh, the, there are two types of uh, mutation. One is the class one mutation. Uh, what is uh, in class one mutation? What happens uh, when uh, you have class one mutations? It will confer proliferative or survival advantage, but do not affect the differentiation. Examples are BCR ABLE, all right, uh, NK RAS, and also uh, FLT3 activating mutations, which we see in CML like uh, situations, all right. And then uh, we also have, on the other hand, we have class two mutations, which serve primarily to impair hemopoietic differentiation and subsequent apoptosis. So again, either it affects uh, uh, it, uh, the mutation uh, confer proliferation advantage to the cancer cells, but do not affect differentiation. And uh, the, the, on the other hand, uh, it impairs differentiation. The class two mutations impairs the differentiation, all right? So the cells will be arrested at the uh, quite a primitive stage. And this type of class two mutations include uh, AML E2 and PML RARA, okay? And also point mutations in AML. So as a general rule, uh, this class one and class two mutations will cause ALL. And also uh, the class one mutation uh, can cause a CML-like picture disease and uh, class two mutations MDS-like uh, picture. 
All right. So we have uh, also seen the types of tumor, uh, the types of cancer related genes in the previous lecture. So briefly, I go through again uh, tumor suppressor gene uh, prevent cell overgrowth. Uh, if there is uh, overgrowth, we turn it term as neoplasia. So uh, TSG or tumor suppressor gene is involved in the cell cycle control, cell difference, differentiation, and apoptosis. The products promote genomic uh, instability and its inactivation mechanisms include point mutation, deletion, and epigenetic inactivation. For the proto-oncogenes, it codes for proteins that regulate cell growth and differentiation. All right, so this is found in the normal cellular genes that control cell division. So once the proto-oncogenes are mutated, we term as uh, oncogenes. Uh, where they are inappropriately or overexpressed, then they transform the cells by unregulated growth and uh, differentiation. All right, so tumor suppressor gene uh, it prevents apoptosis, and uh, the oncogenes it it will um, um, there is unregulated growth and and differentiations if the proto oncogenes is activated. Uh, if the proto oncogenes is mutated okay so this uh, slide shows uh, the the repertoire of genes uh, expressed by a malignant cell which uh, differ in uh, ways from its normal counterpart so if you look uh, at the picture on the left hand side uh, in normal hemopoiesis where there is a differentiation of cells from blast uh, to promyelocytes and myelocytes and metamyelocytes, uh, the, the normal hemopoiesis uh, occurs uh, here, all right? And then uh, as opposed to the normal hemopoiesis where the cells turn malignant. So, so these genes are expressed either quantitatively as shown in gene B, all right? So, uh, so if this gene B is uh, mutated, so it is uh, expressed in abnormally high level in malignant cells, and gene A is switched off in cancer cells. All right. So uh, it's also either qualitatively, where if you look at gene C, there is a translocation where it produces. For example, uh, fusion proteins. So you can see the fusion proteins uh, from gene A and gene C. So this is a uh, qualitative. You know, a protein is produced, but the quality is not there because of this uh, transform is transformation to malignant uh, uh, malignant cells. All right. So uh, quantity for gene B, for example, only gene gene B is expressed abnormally in high level in malignant. Uh, malignant cells, all right, and gene A is switched off. So these are again a different way of uh, you know understanding or looking at the uh, uh, the repertoire of genes expressed by malignant cells and its uh, pathogenesis, all right. So uh, as a revision, proto oncogenes and oncogenes. Uh, proto oncogene is normal unaltered gene that has the potential to become an oncogene. And oncogene is altered uh, cell genes that cause tumors. And this oncogene is located at breakpoints of chromosomal aberration, such as translocations. All right. So, this is an example of product of oncogene where there is uh, translocation. Okay. So, as we have seen earlier, cancer is uh, usually uh, from the process of uh, multi step uh, hits. All right, to the gene, okay? So in the first hit, there is a, a translocation and then uh, there is a cooperative mutations in the secondary hits where it will turn the cells into malignant potential. For the first hit, uh, translocation is only, you know, uh, it may not be uh, detected, all right? There's only few cells, but the subsequently after the second hit, the, the cells will become malignant and can, can be detected. So this is the pathogenesis of how uh, translocation uh, uh, give rise to cancer. All right. So this slide.
okay, is a summary of uh, between oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So it, for the oncogenes, uh, there is a gain of growth promoting, all right? And for the tumor suppressor genes, there is loss of growth inhibit, inhibit, uh, inhibitory tumor suppressor genes. And cancer is a cumulative phenotypic manifestation of all these mutations in oncogenes and also tumor suppressor gene, where it causes malignant transformation, all right? And usually it requires um, multiple mutations in uh, the different oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, all right? And also from the last lecture, not only that, uh, we have seen that oncogene, not only tumor, uh, oncogene and the tumor suppressor genes are aberrated for cancers. From the uh, algorithm study uh, that was recently published, there also, uh, there's also the role of DNA methylation uh, for in the pathogenesis of cancer. All right? So these are also the driver genes for cancer. Okay. Um, uh, how is hematological malignancy uh, made? Uh, of course, from the clinical features. Okay, sometimes you can um, easily uh, or not easily you can st strongly suspect that, that the patient have a particular uh, uh, hematological cancer. For example, in patient with uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, clinically the patient may may have enlarged uh, spleen, or in Burkitt's lymphoma there is a uh, also uh, swelling uh, and uh, usually the, the, there is a characteristic history and also areas where the patient comes from, for example, in Burkitt's lymphoma in the African uh, subjects, all right? But otherwise, uh, the clinical manifestations of cancer can be, you know, uh, it's difficult to distinguish because they may share uh, the same uh, sign and symptoms from other diseases as well, for example, infection, all right? And then uh, we have to resort to the full blood picture and microscopy uh, to look at the morpholo morphology of the cells. Also bone marrow aspirate and biopsy to check uh, for the proteins in the cytoplasm or cell nucleus or on the surface, uh, immunophenotyping and cytogenetics, all right? And last but not least, uh, you know, molecular PCR-based methods. The reason why under, I put in pink is because, you know, this, uh, this uh, technique may not be available even in some centers in, in Malaysia. Okay. So what are we talking about molecular? So again, it's the cytogenetics and the uh, molecular diagnosis from the cell, uh, chromosomes, and DNA. All right, and this is an uh, example of karyotyping. So this is the photo of the chromosomes where the picture shows a normal cell which has uh, 46 chromosomes. And in karyotyping in cancer cells, a part of a chromosome can be missing, duplicated or displaced. So this is an example of patient with MDS. You can see here, all right? A part of the long arm of chromosome five is chromosome five is missing, which we call deletion. All right, you can see here. So this is a, a five Q uh, deletion or five Q minus. All right. So if a patient has this kind of uh, karyotyping picture. Uh, uh, the patient is diagnosed uh, with MDS with 5Q minus syndrome. This is uh, very, uh, uh, of course, with the clinical uh, information and also physical examination. All right. So, with uh, you know suspected uh, clinical information and also on physical examination, and if the patient has this uh, karyotyping uh, results we can uh, diagnose the patient uh, with MDS, with 5Q minus syndrome, all right? Please disregard the, the code, morphology code, all right? And other visible aberrations uh, with karyotyping, in other words, uh, we can uh, see under the current resolution, which is three to five, uh, 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 resolution three to five uh, base 
not base pairs, huh? mega base pairs resolution. Uh, the ones that you can see with karyotyping is, uh, of course, uh, deletion 5 uh, MDS with 5, 5Q minus. Again, please disregard the code. And then translocation T922 is AML, inversion AML, uh, AML with inversion 3. Of course, the trisomy because uh, karyotyping, uh, you know, uh, we can easily see the numerical aberration and then monosomy, hypodiploidy or hyperdiploidy, right? Okay, this is an example of fish. This is another method uh, for you to make a diagnosis. So uh, as we have seen earlier, it's a fragment of DNA probe uh, labeled with fluorescence uh, dye. And this probe binds to specific parts of DNA or a gene or larger part of DNA. And if the probe binds uh, to a gene or part DNA, you see a fluorescent spot. Okay, uh, this is an example of fish uh, in patients with CML where there is a translocation of 922. Uh, chromosome 9 is labeled as red and chromosome uh, 22 is labeled as green. Uh, so normal situation, we see two pairs of the dots, all right? And then if there is a translocation, you can see the combination of the dots. So this shows the translocation 9 and 22. Okay, so molecular diagnostics, uh, if a gene or combination of gene, uh, 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 fusion gene go, codes for a specific protein, the, the fusion protein is CML, produces the protein bcr -ABL. The presence of fusion gene uh, bcr -ABL also can be measured by de detecting bcr -ABL RNA in the blood. So basically what this slide says is that, you know, um, under the normal resolution karyotyping, we can see the chromosomal translocation, okay? And we can also see with fish. So this, uh, this type of uh, combination, fusion gene also can be detected by either RNA or DNA in the uh, patient sample, all right? So we can also detect uh, by uh, measuring the presence of bcr able gene uh, RNA in the blood. Okay, so this slide uh, is shared by uh, Dr. Ishlina by, uh, from IMR. So this shows the algorithm for leukemia molecular studies. All right. So this uh, leukemia molecular studies uh, algorithm is used uh, when patient samples are sent to IMR, uh, IMR uh, if the patients are suspected to have acute myeloid leukemia. So the algorithm is uh, explained in detail here. So once they receive the specimen, uh, RNA will be extracted where RNA will be checked for leukemia translocation study. And then uh, 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 through this leukemia translocation study, sometimes you can confirm AML cases, all right? The different translocation, but uh, DNA is also, if the results are not, <coughs> if you can't get any translocation from this leukemia translocation study, you have to do DNA extraction and check for the uh, mutation studies uh, for the following mutation, translocation 821, inversion 16, and 1616 translocation, okay? So if they, uh, they don't have any identified mutation, they will proceed to molecular screening for following mutation, FLIT3 and MPM1, all right? And FLIT3 and PREM1 will be... Uh, 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 if the patient is positive, so they will, uh, uh, if the, sorry, if the patient is uh, still negative, subsequently they will screen for the SIPA mutation, all right? And then also molecular screening for uh, the following mutations uh, are done as well. So this is an, an uh, algorithm for leukemia study. So in this algorithm, uh, they use RNA and DNA, and for the Leukemia translocations, these are the translocations that are detected. So the 30 leukemia translocations. And then for the AML uh, mutation studies, uh, uh, FLIT3, uh, uh, they identify uh, both FLIT3 ITD and FLIT3 D835 mutation. 
also NPM1 circuit and CPAP by PCR and sequencing. All right, so these are the mutations that are checked. So uh, for hematology malignancies, uh, actually historically, uh, hematology malignancies have been at the forefront among cancers that use genetic analysis for diagnosis, for classification, prognostic prognostication, and also therapeutic decision making. All right. So uh, some other cancers also use uh, genetic analysis, but historically, uh, hematologic malignancies uh, actually have been using all this uh, genetic analysis for its. Uh, um, uh, different uh, uses in treatment of the patient. Dif sorry, different steps or processes in the treatment of the patient, All right? So genetic characterization, why is it important? So it's important in the clinical evaluation, all right? And it's also continu continuously evolving, you know? Uh, there is uh, increased, uh, with increased genomic evaluation, it will also help to improve uh, molecular diagnostic technologies, which is important uh, for us here as uh, pathologists, all right? So this in term, in term also will, you know, if you have improvement in the molecular diagnostic uh, technologies, it will also in, uh, will help in the pharmacogenomics and personalized uh, genomics where the patient can have a more uh, you know, targeted uh, treatment for the cancer uh, and uh, towards the, the aim of achieving personal, personalized medicine. All right. So this is example of personalized medicine using uh, genetic, uh, genetic analysis for the diagnosis and management of the patient. All right. So, you know, uh, if the patient, for example, patient with suspected AML translocation 1517, we know that the, the patient has translocation chromosome 15 and 17, and we can give a, a targeted uh, therapy, which is uh, ATRA, which will, um, you know, help the, the cells that are aberrated to, to differentiate into subsequent uh, cells that are more mature, all right? So besides acute leukemias, uh, you know, uh, genetic an analysis also contribute to diagnosis and management of patients with CML and BNT uh, lymphomas, also my multiple myeloma. All right. So you know, one thing that um, I didn't mention earlier is about, you know, well, uh, NGS can be not can be NGS, you know, application of NGS to patient or genetic anal analysis to patients uh, can be very, uh, uh, can be expensive, all right. Uh, but uh, inshallah, hopefully, yeah, within uh, the next few years, the cost will, uh, the price will reduce, all right. So as this, this graph shows uh, the, the, sorry, the cost of the uh, analysis, genomic analysis in patients, all right? So if you look at this diagram, uh, the, uh, the, as the years in the horizontal axis, you know, as the uh, number of genes have increased uh, in terms of their sequencing, all right? So from 2007 to two over 10 years, uh, uh, so the number of genomes, uh, sequencing of genomes have increased uh, exponentially. All right, uh, but if you look at the cost, uh, the cost per genome has also uh, reduced uh, significantly, and we hope that uh, this uh, technology or genetic analysis, irrespective of what type analysis we use, you know, the price will also uh, go down subsequently in years to come. All right. So uh, the value of uh, findings from the, the results of genetic uh, analysis of the genes that are affected in hematological malignancies also has uh, uh, it has also been incorporated in the uh, WHO classification of uh, leukemia 
of lymphoid malignancies, all right, as we have seen here, uh, also in the last lecture where uh, WHO classification has reached a consensus to incorporate uh, the details expanding the genetic and molecular landscape of numerous lymphoid neoplasm and their clinical correlates, all right. So this is the, you know, the integration of uh, morphology and genetics into the classification of uh, lymphoid neoplasm, all right? This has, uh, in a way, generated new diagnostic approaches, improved prognostic and predictive models, and the therapeutic. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the neoplasm, AML, and related precursor neoplasms. So we can see the details here. I've, uh, you know, I won't go through because I'm already, we already discussed last week. And then these are the details, for example, all right, which uh, I have also mentioned earlier. So if a patient is suspected to have AML with transpiration 821, and then uh, regardless of the blast, blast counts, the patient will be diagnosed as, uh, you know, uh, um, AML if they have the translocation runs one, all right? Or if they have the, the genetic abnormality runs one, runs uh, X1, all right? The same for AML, promyelocytic leukemia. So if they have uh, translocation uh, 15, 17, uh, regardless of the blast count, uh, they will be diagnosed with P PML, RRA, acute promyelocytic leukemia. And then some group of genetic disorders will have an adverse prognosis for the patient. For example, AML translocation 915, uh, 6, 6, 6, 9, inversion 3, for example. All right. So if, AM, if the patient has uh, mutated MP1N and uh, mutations of SEPA, this has a favorable, favorable prognosis, all right? Okay, so uh, that's why European Leukemia Net 2017 has come with uh, AML risk certification by genetics, all right? So, um, so with this uh, genetic abnormalities, the risk certification of patients can be classified into favorable, intermediate, and adverse, all right? So these are the list of patients with favorable uh, prognosis, for example, translocation 821, all right? And which patients with adverse, uh, 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 adverse um, prognosis if they have translocation of 6, 9. Okay, so this slide, um, Okay, this slide shows the ALL uh, genetic aberrations, all right? So there are also uh, different uh, or various uh, type of genetic aberrations in patients with ALL. For example, they have BCR able-like, okay, 9% of that, and then hypodiploid chromosome, all right? and also hyperdeployed chromosomes. So these are the few examples. So this slide uh, again shows the acute myeloid leukemia chromosome aberrations, all right? So this uh, summarize uh, the whole uh, type of uh, genetic abnormalities in AML. Okay. All right, uh, the importance of uh, knowing uh, the genetic abnormalities uh, in hematologic uh, malignancies uh, can be summarized here, all right? So they can be uh, recurrent genetic mutations. We know that they are, if, sorry, we know that uh, in leukemia, they're also recurrent genetic mutations. Uh, they can be additional markers that can be used for diagnosis, prognosis, and follow-up. And these are examples of uh, gene mutations in AML or MDS, right? So, uh, you know, um, there is uh, genetic mutations, for example, FLT3, NRAS, GERA, SEPA, RANS1, TP53, and MLL are some of the, uh, some of the examples, right? So I think this slide, I think last, uh, this is the part, uh, 
part one of my discussion because uh, what I've done is I break the presentation into part one and part two. So I'm reaching the last part of part one so that everybody can have a, a break, huh? Dr. Verdi, just a three or four minutes break. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so this is, uh, okay. Uh, the future genes lah in in uh, CML. Eh? So knowing uh, you know the chromo chromosomal aberration and the uh, genetic aberration, eh? the DNA abnormalities, the mutations in the gene, okay, can help us uh, for the treatment of patients with uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. All right, we know that traditionally uh, the first generation of uh, imatinib has been used for leukemia. All right. But uh, this gives rise to drug resistance uh, because mutations in PCR able gene uh, render the kinase no longer inhibited by the imat imat imatinib. So how do uh, uh, how do uh, we, uh, physicians overcome it? Overcome this? Uh, the solution is to develop new inhibitors similar to imatinib but better. And the second second generation is uh, dasatinib or nilotinib. So they are small molecule TK inhibitor which inhibits BCR able with higher affinity than imatinib. So this is uh, the value of knowing. Uh, the mutations uh, that are caused by translocation 922 uh, in CML, all right? So we go one step further. You diagnose the patient uh, to have chronic myeloid leukemia uh, if they have 922 translocation by uh, either by chromosomal analysis and also FISH, all right? But you go one step higher because one step further, you have to do another uh, another uh, analysis to look at the mutations that are associated with resistance resistance in patients uh, with uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, right? So it doesn't stop there. So these are the options. Lah. And uh, the mutations that confer resistance to imatinibs uh, can be a lot of, as well, but can be screened, all right? Okay, and uh, for AML, as we know, uh, we use uh, the differentiation inducing agents. They induce the immature blood cells into terminal differentiation, and this replenish the mature red blood cell population in the patients. All right. So, uh, so uh, with uh, the diagnosis. Uh, at the fingertips, translocation nine, uh, translocation 1517. Okay, so treatment of AML can be, uh, treatment of AML, PML, RARA can be instituted by using the specific uh, inducing agent. All right, and then uh, this is part of the 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 trip, the uh, chemotherapy agent lah, kill off the remaining immature blood cells from patients bloodstream by using cytorubin or anthracycline. All right. So the presence of a PML RARA fusion predicts a favorable response to differentiation therapy with ATRA and is currently the most curable subtype of acute myeloid leukemia, right? Okay, so um, Dr. Ferdi and ladies and gentlemen, saya, kita berhenti dulu, boleh ke? We All right. for well, three minutes. Uh, yeah, we come back. Pukul berapa ya? Uh, I think uh, you need five or ten minutes, bro. Uh, boleh lah. Okay. We uh. could come back in uh, 14, uh, yeah, 14, 8 here, I think. 14, 8. Okay. Thank you, bro. Okay, thank you. So I'll leave the question to the last account. Eh? Yeah. Um, buat teman-teman, uh, para partisipan, para senior, para guru-guru uh, besar sekalian yang punya kesempatan atau pertanyaan, boleh menuliskan di kolom chat. ya. Pertanyaan boleh dalam bahasa Indonesia, nanti tim dari Dr. Thea dan Dr. Fida akan menyiapkan dalam bahasa Inggris supaya tidak ada hesitation kosongkan ya untuk memberikan pertanyaan
tim panitia nggak nyediain ini ya video yang kemarin ya untuk uh, Chris begini panitia tete ya tete coba yang ada di sini sama tete seperti tete ya ini boleh di share ya nggak apa apa lima sepuluh menit ya Iya, daripada nunggu. Siap. Always keep the best. Faculty of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. Dr. Sutomo Hospital is a public hospital owned by the government with most complete services in East Indonesia. In its development, Dr. Sutomo Hospital continues to develop Central Laboratory of Clinical Pathology. Clinical Pathology Department also has five divisions of subspecialization program established 2050. Other than that, provide solutions that can help maintain and overcome health problems until now. Clinical pathologists and all the residents always give the best effort to be the leader of education and service to support the vision and mission of Dr. Sutomo Hospital. The Central Laboratory strives to continuously improve and maintain good quality services in accordance with international standards. winding journey has been traversed by the faculty in its efforts to transform the knowledge in the field of medical science and devout science to improve the welfare of the nation, the state, and humanity.
Hospital is one of our affiliation hospitals where the residents can improve their knowledge and skills. Faculty of Medicine at Langa University is the second oldest faculty in Indonesia. Dr. Sutomo Hospital is a public hospital owned by the government with most complete services in East Indonesia. In its development, Dr. Sutomo Hospital continues to develop Central Laboratory of Clinical Pathology. Clinical Pathology Department also has five divisions of subspecialization program, established 2050. Other than that, provide solutions that can help maintain and overcome health problems until now. clinical pathologies and all the residents always give the best effort to be the leader of education and service to support the vision and mission of Dr. Sutomo Hospital. The Central Laboratory strives to continuously improve and maintain good quality services in accordance with international standards. All right. Do you still have time, Prof? Pardon me, Prof Nareza, still mute. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Dr. Ferdi, saya teruskan ya. Yeah? Okay, all right, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Okay, Thank saya you. switch off uh, video. Saya share slide. Okay, boleh, boleh nampak ya? Ya. Yeah. Ya. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so sekarang kita uh, teruskanlah dengan uh, part 2 of the this lecture on the genetics of hematological malignancies where we will see the application lah, uh, especially in diagnosis and also research examples and also risk stratification uh, using uh, Malaysian data as an example. So just to recapitulate, um, 
kita punya outline masa kita bincang tadi ya. Uh, kita sudah cover uh, normal hematopoiesis and its dysregulation. Kita sudah tengok uh, apakah yang you know regulate the process of normal hematopoiesis and what happen if there is dysregulation, especially in the transcription factors. <coughs> and then we have looked at the molecular basis of hematological malignancies. Uh, sekarang kita pergi kepada diagnosis and classification of hematologic malignancies based on the basis of genetics lah. All right, where is uh, commonly used uh, this uh, uh, genetics uh, classification uh, for the you know daily use of the patient diagnosis and classification, and then so I can share a little bit about data about the Malaysia lah, and last but not least the gene expression, uh, the STEM one gene expression is functional uh, and biochemical analysis. Yeah, okay. So uh, kita terus kepada diagnosis and classification of hematologic malignancies on the basis of genetics lah, which uh, saya refer kepada this article uh, um, that uh, you know that was published in 2016. Uh, as you know, uh, as we have seen here now, um, up to now, uh, genetic alterations have defined the subclasses of patients that we have lah with, with hematological malignancies. For example. Acute leukemia, MDS, myeloproliferative neoplasm, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, dan classical Hodgkin lymphoma. We will see uh, in detail lah, uh, macam mana the uh, the the subclasses uh, and the diagnosis have been uh, have been uh, defined lah. Alright. Okay. So just to uh, Uh, revise balik lah, you know, even in AML lah, ada banyak-banyak-banyak uh, mutation lah, right, dalam AML sendiri, ini tidak lagi termasuk disease-disease uh, uh, hematological malignancies yang lain lah. So, dalam uh, dalam AML lah, uh, the, usually dia akan Uh, they can uh, 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 group the mutation into uh, various uh, uh, clusters. Lah. For example, uh, the ones that are affected by the fusion genes. Uh, we have uh, PML, RARA here, and then the RANS1X, uh, RANS1X, uh, for example, okay, and the uh, MIG11 CBFP. All right, so the this fusion, uh, this uh, uh, mutations are grouped within the fusion, this uh, uh, group as fusion genes lah, arises from the fusion genes. And then kita ada myeloid transcription factors, huh? Uh, which are SEPA and one uh, run uh, runs one, and then we have the group of uh, uh, mutation group uh, classified and the tumor suppressor genes, uh, which is uh, inclusive of TP53, and then we have another group uh, which is classified under splice uh, spliceosome genes, right? And then uh, we have DNA modification genes, MPM1, uh, chromo chromatin mod modifiers, uh, which are MLL fusions and the cohesins, another group. And we have also signal, signal uh, transduction genes, which are FLT3 and ras and, and the rest. Okay. So in AML, these genes are recurrently mutated. Uh, mutated. And they belong to distinct uh, functional groups or, or pathways. Uh, so this uh, uh, featured here are the most prominent functional groups and genes associated uh, uh, in the de novo AML. So of course there are other other genes as well which are mutated, but the significance. Uh, Uh, some are still under research and investigation, all right? So let's look at the diagnostic uh, and classification of malignancies based on the basis of genetics. Uh, this table is uh, quite uh, exhaustive, yeah? So, um, tapi kita highlight lah kepada, I think uh, 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 the audience can see what are uh, uh, highlighted in bold, yeah? Uh, for if we look here uh, for AML, uh, the this table shows the genetic alterations of of diagnostic use and uh, also the therapeutic or prognostic value in our routine clinical practice in selected uh, myeloid neoplasm. So we first go to AML. 
Okay, kalau uh, saya tengok, kita tengok yang highlighted, uh, yang in bold, uh, so the the ones in bold are actually uh, are of diagnostic value. That means it's already been used for diagnosis. All right, so these are highlighted in bold. And then uh, uh, contoh dia that are already in use for diagnosis are uh, translocation 821. Okay, the genes that affect the runs one or runs, uh, you know, the uh, translocation 821. So the gene is run runs one. Okay, so sometimes saya tersilap saya kata run one. Eh. Okay, uh, frequency dia 7% dalam AML. Alright, and then uh, normal function dia, they are core binding factor transcription factors. Core binding factor transcription factors. That means they are one of the transcription factors and we are seen just now, you know, in hematopoiesis. So how do we detect uh, translocation 821? Uh, is detected by karyotypic and fish. Karyotype and fish, alright. And if a patient with AML has this... Uh, um, translocation, it confer a favorable prognosis to the patient. All right. So in this case, uh, the presence of 821 by karyotype of fish, will, you know, the patient will confer a good prognosis. And there's also, um, you know, uh, um, uh, establish um, uh, establish a regi regime for the treatment uh, for trans patients with 821, all right? Uh, for the gen if you look at the last column here, ge genotype directed therapies is still not available. Lah. That means we have still to use the conventional chemo chemotherapy, but it has a favorable prognosis. And then uh, we look at the next one that is highlighted bold, which is inversion 16, all right? So frequency is 5%. Uh, the normal function uh, is uh, still, uh, you know, um, uh, not yet uh, known. And how do we, we detect? Uh, by karyotype and fish. And the prognosis is also favorable. And at the moment, there's still not yet genotype-directed therapies for patients with inversion 16. But again, it confers a good prognosis. And then, of course, the bold one here, we have PML RARA, frequency 13%. All right, normal function in the retinoid acid receptor. Uh, how do you use to detect either FISH and PCR? and prognosis favorable because we have a genotype-directed therapy, which is ATRA or arsenic. Okay, and then uh, as opposed to those favorable prognostic markers which, which have been mentioned, on the other hand, we have translocation 69, okay, frequency is 1%, normal function in nucleophorin, but a patient will have a very adverse prognosis. And at the moment, genotype directed therapy is not yet available, okay, and also the same if the patient have inversion 3. All right, so it's also adverse associated with adverse prognosis. What about uh, NPM1? Uh, frequency is 29%. Uh, normal function is for nuclear phosphoprotein. Phospho how we, how, which te what technology do we detect? We use sequencing, and uh, this mutation confers a favorable prognosis. Okay, and we also uh, can use uh, our, uh, uh, MRD or minimal residual disease monitoring as well to check for this gene. So this is considered genotype directed therapies. Okay, so a patient having NPM1 mutation is is uh, considered is uh, associated with favorable prognosis. Whereas if you have uh, patient have uh, FLT3 ITD or TKD, you know, it's still also high, yeah? frequency 37%. Uh, diagnosis also by, you know, the energy to detect is by uh, sequencing PCR, but the adverse, uh, there is uh, adverse outcome associated, all right? But the good thing is that, you know, there is genotype-directed therapies, which uh, people, uh, physicians, uh, patients uh, can be treated with FLT3 inhibitors, all right? 
So the other example is by Elilik Sepa, all right, favorable prognosis runs one adverse prognosis if it happens in patient with AML, all right. This is the genetic uh, abnormality, right? And then uh, if a patient also has AML with, with BCR able, the prognosis it is adverse prognosis, all right? So there's other some other uh, other genetic uh, aberration uh, that uh, are also involved here, all right? And uh, 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 prognosis, uh, most of them are adverse, adverse prognosis. So let's focus on, on all these, the ones that have uh, been used uh, uh, for diagnosis and also therapeutic or prognostic uh, use in the patients. Okay, because I think this is this this is also related to the to the questions that I see in the chat. All right. So these are the the, the mutations that you know uh, usually is worth uh, screening for lah, if you have the. Uh, availability or ability to screen okay what about for mds all right uh, so again the, the disease type and the mds and the ones that are highlighted here uh, the genes that are you know in this uh, uh, group uh, as sf3 b beta b1 and also deletion 5q minus all right so for the first uh, gene mutation, frequency is quite a lot, uh, 15 to 30 percent. All right, the normal function as we see here for pre-mRNA splicing and then deletion 5Q is 6 percent. All right, technologies to detect is sequencing and for deletion 5Q minus, we can do uh, karyotyping. Uh, all right, and both this, uh, the presence of this uh, uh, genes actually are associated with favorable prognosis and the genotype directed treatment uh, for deletion 5Q- is linalidomide and uh, also at the moment there's trials involving splicing inhibitors, all right? Uh, next is uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm. Uh, again, for myeloproliferative neoplasm, we see the genes that are highlighted in bold, all right? For example, uh, BCR able, BCR able uh, frequency almost 100%, normal function is tyrosine kinase. Uh, these are the patients with uh, CML with BCR able positive. We detect, as we have seen earlier, fish or PCR, and there's a genotype directed treatment, which is TKI or tyrosine kinase inhibitors, okay? For the non BCR able, we have all these uh, mutations, lah, the JAK2, Jack, Jack okay, which is uh, higher, 74%. Again, the function is tyrosine kinase. Uh, sequencing and PCR is the method of detection. And at the moment, there's no directed geno genotype directed treatment, even though the frequency is high. Okay, and you can see other examples here. So the ones, uh, again, as I have said earlier, the ones in poll are being used for. Uh, diagnosis, even though some uh, do not have a genomic directed treatment, but you can, you know, you can give also, uh, besides the diagnosis, you can also uh, uh, give, uh, uh, it can, it's also significant in the determination of prognosis of some of these genes, all right? So uh, the rest are, are here, all right? Um, you know, CMML and then MDS. Okay, so these are the other examples, MDS stroke myeloproliferative neoplasm. For, so what about uh, B, uh, B lymphoid, uh, B lymphoid uh, neoplasms, all right? So for the LPL or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, we have the ones in bold here, lah, which is MIG-88 and Harry-Cell leukemia, we have the BRAF, BRAF gene. All right, so this again, uh, e even in B cell lymphoid neoplasms, these genes, even though uh, they are a lot, but only some are used for diagnosis. So the most uh, common or important is in follicular lymphoma, lah, if they have a uh, mutated BCL2 gene, eh? uh, you know, which we detect by uh, fish as well. This uh, will have, you know, uh, will have, a, a can, you, you can uh, diagnose a patient to have follicular or uh, DL, BCL, or diffuse large cell, diffuse large, large B cell lymphoma, okay? So BCL, yeah. Okay, and there's a treatment for that as well. 
So for the mental cell lymphoma, translocation 11, 14, all right, yeah, this occur in 80 to 90 percent, all right, detected by, by fish as well. So this uh, translocation also can, uh, can be detected and used as uh, some of the diagnosis for B cell lymphoid neoplasm. Okay, and then this is a continuation. I think uh, I just, uh, as, as I mentioned just now, uh, mutations of gene, gene names in bold are of a diagnostic value, all right? So for example, uh, Keras, uh, Brach gene, okay? All right, uh, the next table uh, showed the NK and T cell neoplasms. Lah. Uh, as we see here, the mutation in gene, gene names in bold are of diagnostic value, which is uh, AL, ALK uh, rearrangement, all right? And also uh, DAVS 22 rearrangement. Okay, so uh, these two uh, genes uh, will confer a favorable diagnosis. And for ALK arrangement, we have ALK uh, inhibitors as a genotype directed uh, therapies. Uh, so the next, uh, the next uh, topic that we would like to cover, that I would like to cover is uh, the latest uh, information about a study from Malaysia, lah, which is by Prof. Roslin and the group. Prof. Roslin is uh, in USM on the, you know, our medic sister medical school in the northeast uh, of Malaysia. So uh, what they have done is to have a cohort of uh, patients, adult patient with AML, all right, and they look at the genetic profile and risk stratification in relation to the age, gender, and ethnicity, all right. So they assess the genetic profile using the Mormon's hier hierarchical classification, where Mormon's hier hierarchical classification look at the chromosome translocations. And also uh, the European Le Le uh, Leukemia Network 2017 based uh, risk stratifications. All right, they look uh, this uh, profile in uh, relation to age, gender, and ethnicity. So this is uh, the first uh, kind of this, uh, you know, large cohort that is uh, presented uh, in the Malaysian adult AML patients. Okay, uh, so they look at 854 patients uh, from. Uh, three different uh, referral centers for uh, hematological malignancies, all right? So uh, from this 854 AML patient, 52% uh, uh, were males and 48 were females. And the comprise of Malays, 59%, Chinese, 32%, and Indians, 8%, all right? So of uh, the patients that have abnormal carrier type, 36% had translocations, 10% uh, deletion, and 5% trisomies. And the commerce genotype was FLIT3 FLIT ITD NPM, and NPM, NPM wild type. All right. And this uh, occur in 276 out of 404 patients, which is 66.7%. All right. So if they apply uh, the ELN 2017 risk stratification on 495 patients, 41% were classified as favorable, uh, 39% as intermediate, and 20% as adverse groups. There were more females in the favorable risk group compared to males. The adverse risk is higher in patients above 60 uh, of age compared to below 60. And this study uh, highlighted that uh, distribution of genetic profiles and risk stratification between age groups and gender uh, were heterogeneous, were very variable, okay, but not among the ethnic groups. So again, uh, the study elucidated, elucidated the diversity of adult AML genetic profiles between Southeast Asian and other regions uh, worldwide. Okay, so to illustrate this, uh, let's look at some of the you know figures that were in the that were uh, in the publication. Uh, so uh, this figure shows the cytogenetic profiles based on the gender comparison. All right. So uh, uh, the top one is the females, uh, and the below is the male. All right. So the dark blue is the normal carrier type. 
and then the various colors depict the various uh, karyotype in the patient. All right. So uh, if you look at the female, the most common is uh, uh, translocation 821. All right. Also, uh, for the males, the most common is the, uh, the translocation 821. And besides translocation 821, they also have translocation 815, 17, vision 16, and translocation uh, and uh, 11 uh, Q, Q3 uh, uh, tra translocation. All right. So from here, we can uh, deduce that, you know, the most common uh, cytogenetic abnormality in both male and female is translocation 821 followed by 1517. And then uh, almost half of the patients do have normal karyotype. Okay, normal karyotype here means that, you know, uh, you know, they still can have abnormal because of the limited availability of the uh, karyotyping, uh, which cannot detect a uh, smaller or micro deletion, for example, right? And then uh, this is uh, the next figure is the cytogenetic uh, classification based on the age group. So they classify the patients into uh, different ages uh, from below 13, 15 years, 16, 19 years, 20 to 29 years, uh, subsequently to 70 years and above. So if you look at this picture, uh, uh, the the dark blue or the navy blue bar here uh, indicate the the deletion uh, the deletion karyotype here. All right. So we can see here the karyotype uh, abnormalities in the karyotype occur highest in the uh, you know uh, age group uh, sixty to sixty nine and seventy years and above. All right. And then uh, for the uh, you know you can see the uh, trisomy karyotype, which is depicted in uh, light blue here. All right, uh, the translocation uh, karyotype is uh, also uh, the is also you know occurs uh, uh, quite significant here, thirteen, and uh, reduces as the age uh, increase for the patient. But therefore, the trisomy karyotype. Uh, you know, it occurs uh, in a large group of patients uh, who are younger, 13 to 15 years of age. And then uh, this is looking at the major cytogenetic groups and ethnicity. Okay, it doesn't show uh, much difference. Uh, patients with uh, translocation, uh, for example, all right, the percentage is about the same, whether it's Indian, Chinese or Malays, all right? And deletion, we can see a slight uh, uh, difference here. And then uh, on the other hand, portion also have a normal karyotype. So the next slide is age distribution of, of AML patients by their cytogenetic findings. All right. So the curve is a bit uh, haphazard, but you can see here that, you know, between uh, 20 to 29 years and above the 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 translocation and also the uh, trisomy is, is, is quite high in the patients as well, all right? And then uh, there's also, uh, you know, it, it uh, is also the, the, if you look at the translocation uh, 214, all right, 214, normal uh, 294. So it, translocation also reduces as the, the age increases, all right? Okay, and then this is uh, the uh, age distribution of ML patient by the MPM and FLT3 ITD mutational findings. Huh? So um, you can see that uh, FLT3 mutation is detected uh, from, uh, I, I think uh, basically it, it picks uh, in the patient uh, between 40 to 49 years of age. And then uh, the MPM1 mutation is detected uh, also highest in the 40 to 49 years of age, all right? Okay, so uh, the last part of this lecture is just uh, sharing uh, the data about uh, gene expression, biochemical and functional analysis of uh, stro stromal uh, interaction molecule or STEM1 uh, silencing in acute myeloid leukemia cell lines, uh, which is uh, done by our MSc student, okay? So, um, 
as we know, uh, leukemia uh, is a, a abnormal uh, proliferation of immature cells in the bone marrow and also spill into, into the blood. And this uh, uh, shows, the graph shows the age standardized world incidence and mortality rates of, of leukemia in uh, countries uh, of the world, all right? So uh, uh, in Western Asia, you know, you can see the figures are, are listed here and Southeast Asia. And the graph shows a uh, highest leukemia incidence rate was in the Northern Amer America, whereas the highest mortality rate here is in Asia, all right? In Malaysia, the leukemia incidence is 6.3%. The mortality rate is 4.4% per 100 population. So this is the incidence uh, rate per 100,000 uh, people in Malaysia for 2019, okay? uh, where it shows the uh, mortality rate as well, uh, which is uh, one6 uh, mortality rate as depicted in, in red here for 100,000 population. This figure is from two, for 2019. Okay, and uh, in, in Malaysia, our figures show that uh, AML represented the highest uh, incidence and mortality rate among leukemia type uh, in Malaysia. This is uh, from 2019 figures, okay? Okay, the five-year survival rate is 40 to 63% in less than 60 years of, of age. And AML still has the worst survival rate for patients uh, in Malaysia from the National Cancer Institute in Malaysia. And relapse occur in 40 to 50% of younger and the great majority of elderly patients, all right? So this is the... AML incidence rate, the same, uh, which shows uh, increasing over, over the years. Huh? <coughs> so the, why this research was carried out, uh, we know that uh, there is disrupted, uh, when there is disrupted cal calcium hemostasis, this uh, is the basis for tumor initiation and progression. All right. So the slide shows the you know, the STEM1 uh, gene, which uh, is involved in the calcium hemostasis in the normal cells. So uh, if uh, there is dysregulation of this gene uh, in cancer, it will cause dysregulated calcium hemostasis uh, by either by proliferation, which affect, it affect the cell cycle progression, or uh, maybe apoptosis. And uh, this, this regulated calcium hemostasis also plays a role in drug resistance, uh, also in the stemness of the cells, uh, migration and metastasis and invasion. So STEM1, this, STEM1 is, is uh, if it's dysregulated, it can affect all the uh, processes involved in calcium hemostasis. So uh, this gene, STEM1 gene, uh, and its dysregulation and its role in uh, the cause of causing tumor has been well established in, in many cancers, for example, brain cancers, also uh, for other solid cancers as well. Okay, and also for you know multiple myeloma, ALL, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, where <coughs> in multiple myeloma, it's noted that there is high expression, uh, and silencing of STEM1 reduced the cell growth and arrested the cell cycle. 
All right. Uh, for A ALL, delete, deleting the STEM1 gene in mice with TALL prolong the survival, though reducing the inflammatory process. And in non Hodgkin lymphoma, STEM1 plays a role in cell invasion and migration. So earlier studies have indicated that uh, ORI1 and 2 genes were also found to be linked to HL60 cells proliferation and migration. And also ORI gene was discovered to contribute to timifemate induced cell death in myeloid leukemia. All right. So these uh, three genes have been uh, studied AML. But then uh, the role of STEM1 in, in ML is still unexplored. So the question, the research question is, does STEM1 play a role in AML proliferation and survival? So that's why the objective was to in investigate the, ro the role of STEM1 gene in proliferation and survival of AML cells. And these are the specific objectives. Uh, to determine the uh, small interfering RNA or DSI, uh, small interfering DNA mediated knockdown, uh, STEM1 knockdown in AML cell lines. That means uh, uh, the, you know, the, the gene is uh, knocked out by using a DICER substrate small interfering RNA. And next is uh, once it's knocked down to see its effect uh, of the knockdown on the expression of targeted things, uh, targeted genes involving the RAS uh, P thirteen uh, K and the ROS pathways, okay, which is involved in the um, um, in the release of oxygen uh, ROS pathways, okay, and then assess you know uh, the biochemical of this uh, gene knockdown. Okay, uh, on the intracellular calcium and also the ROS levels in AML cell line, and also last uh, evaluate the functional effect of the uh, knockdown on cell prolif proliferation and colony formation ability. All right, so uh, these are the uh, this is the experimental design where uh, two types of cell lines were used, which is uh, THP1 and Kasumi cells. All right, and then the expression is looked uh, by the real-time PCR. And after uh, that, uh, the knockdown is being done. Uh, the, divide, the study is divided into phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one involves the, uh, looking at the uh, knockdown efficiency, the dose and the time by doing a real-time PCR and Western blot and look at the gene expression profile. And the phase two is looking at the biochemical uh, analysis after the knockdown and how is biochemical analysis done by looking at the intracellular calcium level, okay? And also intracellular uh, ROS level, reactive oxygen species, uh, ROS. And then phase three is the functional study uh, to look at the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the effect of the gene after knockdown to look at the uh, its function, looking by looking at the proliferation and also uh, colony formation by doing the assays for these two um, analysis. So to cut short, so this is the conclusion from the study. Okay, um, uh, what was achieved is uh, there is effective knock, knockdown of the STEM1 gene, okay, and they achieved by using uh, the, you know, the, the concentration of the, uh, the assay at this level and the time that is taken, all right, so they have different time taken and also uh, using different concentration for both the cell lines, but the most important is uh, there is uh, effective knockdown by using the uh, silencing methods. And then uh, second is uh, the knockdown of steam one g resulted in down regulation of KRAS, MAP, K and C make also uh, PKC and NOx uh, two genes in both 
AML cell lines, all right? Whereas uh, for, uh, for the uh, BEX and BCL2, uh, the down re regulation wa was observed in THP1 cells, all right? Uh, both uh, the knockdown reduced the intracellular calcium and uh, ROS level, and uh, steam knockdown reduced AML cell proliferation and colony uh, formation, where it's deduced that uh, this study suggests that STEM1 play a role, may, may play a role in promoting the proliferation and survival of AML cell lines, all right? So this is a, a, a you know, proposed effect of STEM1 knockdown in AML cells, huh? all right? So uh, the, the knockdown of this gene, all right, uh, causes uh, the bags to be upregulated and BCL2 gene to be downregulated, right? And also uh, through the, the various pathways, uh, there is uh, uh, reduced uh, ROS and also reduced calcium, uh, which causes uh, cell proliferation and also uh, survival, all right? So there is inhibition of cell proliferation and survival. So this is the proposed effect of uh, STEM1 knockdown in AML cells, all right? So this is the work done by our student, uh, Dr. Iman. And um, I've come to the last part of the presentation. So in summary, uh, the genetic character characterization of hematologic malignancies have defined the biomarkers uh, segre segregating or delineating specific entities of myeloid and lymphoid neoplasms. And this uh, uh, has resulted in the incorporation into WHO-defined criteria for diagnostic uh, evaluation, all right? Uh, there are many examples of genetic alterations that are not routinely evaluated in standard clinical practice yet. And these uh, alterations may define uh, disease-specific disease entities due to their association, as we have seen uh, earlier, all right, in some of the genes being used in uh, diagnostic or clinical context. And, uh, you know, sequencing uh, using small panels alone may not be sufficient, okay, especially in the uh, lymphoid malignancies. So uh, results of ongoing studies on cohorts uh, and lymphoma patients uh, will be required uh, for to achieve all these, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, aims uh, to character characterize for the genetic aberrations and the genetic characterization of hematologic malignancies uh, have modified and incorporated, right? So uh, we uh, further efforts are needed to produce further examples of disease defining alterations. For example, uh, there is recurrent mutation in a non-coding genome uh, resulting in ectopic expression and activation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And ongoing research is needed to fully define the pathogenic and prognostic alterations, all right? So, uh, with that knowledge uh, of this molecular mechanism, uh, it may provide opportunities for us to identify spe specific therapeutic targets, which is the aim, all right, so that the patients can be treated with specific uh, agents, known agents, or also, uh, on the other hand, develop new or novel uh, specific pharmaceutical agents uh, with the aim of, you know, uh, applying precision medicine or individualized uh, treatment for patients to improve uh, the patient uh, overall survival as well, all right, which, you know, um, is not, <laughs> it's not impossible, maybe 10 years from now. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee as well for the opportunities and also uh, yeah, for the, um, you know, for the, to all the audience for patiently uh, sitting in this uh, online presentation. 
uh, for almost two hours. Eh? So thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Ferdi. Wow, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, we have learned the importance of genetic analysis, yeah, including in patients' management, or as we know in the presence, um, the development of precision medicine, yeah, Prof. Yeah? Or we call that personalized medicines uh, more and become important in today's treatment, especially from your research, right, Prof? We need uh, further evaluations of the uh, medicine. Oh, all right. Um, kita lanjutkan dengan diskusi, ya. Yeah. Dengan diskusi tanya jawab, we will continue to the questions. Um, our team have uh, write the discussion and questions, Prof. So you don't need to read from the chat box. Okay. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> so from the first questions, Prof, come from Dr. Prafa. Uh, he is our resident. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. I like to ask questions with so many genetic abnormality, especially on AML. Yeah? Well, how should we approach the genetic testing? Which genetic that we should check first? The common mutations and start two more mutations? Or should we start from good prognostic genetic towards prognostic? That's a very good question, actually. But, yeah, yeah, very good and yeah. challenging, challenging yeah. question. <laughs> eh? <laughs> Thank you, Miss Prof. Okay. Thank you for the question, eh, Doctor. So, as uh, you know, uh, I think if uh, we recall the first part of the presentation, uh, we have, um, you know, we are following the algorithm for leukemia molecular diagnosis, starting with the, you know, diagnosis and prognostication if available. So for diagnosis, you know, uh, we go, we follow the algorithm. Um, I don't know whether I can share the slide here. Yeah. Maybe I have to recall. Yeah. Okay, nampak kan? Alright. So right. we usually usually we follow this this algorithm. We look at the commonness and then whether it's easily can be easily uh, uh, detected or not, you know. And also the frequency of the gene, uh, the incidence of the gene, whether is you know is highly is the frequency is high or not. Okay, and also associated with prognosis. So this why that's why. Uh, this algorithm is developed, all right? So uh, if, if I may repeat, you know, uh, for the RNA extraction, you look at the 30 uh, translocations in leukemia, all right? Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we use a kit, but sometimes if the kit is not available, we use the common translocations that we can see. For example, uh, 15, 17, translocation 8, 821, for example, all right? And then uh, if it, uh, you, we don't find that translocation, we proceed to DNA extraction. We do a AML mutation study looking at this common uh, following mutation, translocation 821, inversion 16, and then translocation 1616, all right? So if uh, there is... Uh, uh, there is still no mutation identified. We will do molecular screening for the following mutation, FLT3 and CKIT, all right? And also, uh, you know, uh, the other uh, mutations as well, all right? Because as we know, uh, FLT3 uh, and NPM1, they confer different uh, prognosis to the patient. If the patient, AML patient has a FLT3 mutation, it's adverse prognosis. And then MPM1, if they have a mutation, is uh, the opposite favorable prognosis, all right? And if it's still, you know, if, uh, if uh, these mutations are not detected, proceed to SEPA uh, mutation as well. So again, we can't afford to check, you know, to do a massive uh, sequencing or screening for all the mutations, but we focus on which are the uh, commonly found uh, uh, mutations and um, also we need to correlate the, with the clinical information as well. All right, for example, uh, 
you know, uh, the hematological, uh, you know, what we see on the peripheral blood film need to correlate as there and then immunophenotyping. All right. So this, this one you have to do together in tandem. Right. So I hope it answers. Uh, yeah, I think it's very clear, right, Dr. Prafa? Yes, thank you. All right. So this algorithm is also important to reduce the cost here, Prof. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, please, for another questions, Dr. Rafida. Yeah. The second question is from Dr. Aditya. Yeah. Uh, among many chess of mutation as prognostic markers, can we sort out which priority can be recommended considering the examination is quite expensive? Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, almost the same here, Prof. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, focus on prognostic markers. Well, usually it's for diagnosis because that is the most available. But if you are, you know, you have the prognosis, it's good also to look at the process as well because that's very important, right? Yeah, I believe that because mm -hmm. uh, we know we using sequencing is almost thirty million rupees here, Prof. Yeah, <laughs> in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, it's not cheap in Malaysia as well, but we try to incorporate all those information, uh, Doctor Doctor Ferdi. Yeah, yeah. That that's, that's the way forward, right? Okay. Uh, from the third questions come from Doctor Laurencia, also our resident Prof. Good afternoon, Prof. Thank you for your explanation. I would like to ask how important we do this molecular diagnostic to leukemia patients. It's common questions, Prof. Because uh, you know, so, uh, the, I think in Indonesia, this uh, many uh, examinations not available here, Prof. Yeah? Okay. I think this question is the answer is also related yeah. to the previous two questions, right? Yeah. So the answer to that is is important because we may offer the you know specific treatment to the patient, and if uh, targeted therapy or gene directed therapy is available, right? So we can uh, uh, institute that uh, genome directed therapy to the patients. Uh, especially for those with uh, that is assisted with adverse prognosis. Yeah. So the answer is uh, it is important for diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. It's important. Diagnosis. Yeah. And for the treatment itself, yeah, bro, because we know that uh, yeah. if we know the, the the mutations or the cardiotyping, uh, maybe we have a precision medicine for the patients. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Okay, Dr. Erawati. Sorry, uh, before we proceed to the to the this question, I just you know may I ask the availability of what type of tests that are uh, now currently in uh, in uh, Dr. Sutomo Hospital or in in Indonesia for that matter? Do you have? Uh, uh, I mean, what level of test do we have if we suspect patients who have AML? For example, what options yeah. do you have? Yeah, we, I think uh, if you have stuff from hematology, could answer the questions. But in my uh, experience, I think B BCR, BCR ABL, one of the examinations, um, may be related to the CML, right, Prof? Yeah. Yeah, but. For, for AML, I don't know. Maybe if there is, uh, let, let me look at the stuff here. Dr. Sari, maybe? Could you help, Dr. Sari? Because you have a experience in uh, Dermais Hospital. Um, in, in, oh, Dr. Yuli. Dr. Yuli, yeah. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Assalamualaikum. Uh, about the molecular testing uh, in the dermatis, uh, maybe we can, oh, in Sutama, yeah, Prof. Yes, I know, maybe the CRRBL, Prof. Anyway, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sharing, uh, yes, 
there is a molecular, is it? Yeah. What, what, is molecular? what kind of testing, Dr. Sari? Uh, what kind of test do you test? Do you have? In Sutomo Hospital or in Derma Maybe Sutomo? both. Both, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, in Derma is, uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, quite complete. So from uh, BCR ABL for uh, CML and also uh, check to mutation uh, and then uh, yeah, uh, PIS and carotyping for CLL and also uh, PML RARA and also uh, DNA analysis for, so DNA analysis for uh, to see the uh, and deploy it uh, in uh, LLL. Okay, so yeah. the methods that you use are PCR based methods, NGS. Right. Also, we have a uh, NGS here for uh, gene panel, but it's for solid tumor. For oh, solid tumor. Yes, uh, like breast cancer. Like that. All right. So you're richer than us, then. Yes, bro. You are richer than us. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Yuli. All right, so, okay, back to question by Dr. Erawati. Recommendation to do yeah. recommendation to do genetic examination for cancer risk screening. If there is, why is the genomic test that will be recommended? Okay, the answer to this is yes and no. Um, you know, there are some uh, genetic test, testing that are in, in use at the moment for cancer screening, especially for solid cancers, for example, you know, uh, for T TP, you know, TP53 or the tumor suppressor gene, all right, especially in those uh, inherited cancers, uh, for example, leaf Romini syndrome, where they have, you know, um, uh, inherited uh, TP. T53 mutation and uh, you know there are a risk of cancers in the family alike in the siblings for example so it's good you know you can do a genomic examination for you know if your patient you suspect patients who have inherited cancer where the patients have not yet um, manifest okay uh, the other example uh, genomic examination for cancer risk screening is for breast cancer genes BRCA1, BRCA2 as well all right, but for the other cancer, for example, hematology cancers is is quite, you know, it's it's uh, not really. I think not not really. Um, it's not really applicable if you do a genomic test. But that's why I say the answer here is a yes or no. Some some cancers is inherited, so you can do a genetic a screening, and you know you can take uh, certain precautions. For example, uh, you know. Uh, lifestyle of the patient and then you know the patient can uh, the individual can be asked to you know to come for regular checkup uh, mammogram screening for example if there is uh, you know presence of uh, breast cancer genes so I hope it answers the question but the Irawati yeah I think uh, yeah in common of course, many examinations here, Prof. Yeah, should be provided for, uh, special for the screening here, Prof. Okay. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Please, you can raise hand. Yeah, I remember one of an artist um, of America, yeah, Prof. Yeah, that uh, has been treated with surgery of uh, breast, yeah, because he because he had a, a genetic abnormalities, yeah, Prof. Before yeah. it occurs, so and in England we know they have a one million genome project to know the abnormality in uh, England, yeah, Prof. Yeah. Genomic, med genomic medicine is very uh, increasing in England. Okay, is there any questions for Prof. Naraza? I think we have so many information here, Prof. in today's meeting. But um, before, before, in the last uh, lecture, we learned about the, the use of 
uh, fees, karyotyping also. And today we also learn about uh, uh, sequence, gen sequencing, yeah, prop. So it means uh, we have to learn more about uh, these uh, many examinations to provide our clinicians, especially from oncologist division. So they may use that uh, uh, many testing to help uh, patients care, especially in and treating patients using personalized medicines. That the that the uh, that important of the uh, our meetings today, yeah, Prof. All right, if there is no more questions, I think we can uh, close our discussion. It is almost, uh, or oh, not almost, but more than two hours here, bro. <laughs> I think you are so strong, bro. <laughs> <laughs> because if because I, I think so. only 30 minutes, it's so hard. <laughs> oh, because I'm sitting down. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Ria, may you uh, take a picture for our today's meeting before we close? Thank you so much again, Dr. Ferdi, yeah. Dr. Rufida, and uh, our colleagues in Indonesia. Yeah, thank you so much, Profs. And I also announced about our next meeting in 27 February, uh, uh, January, uh, prof, yeah? the topic is about transfusion medicines, the use of molecular uh, testing also in uh, transfusion. That uh, very interesting uh, topic also. So uh, all participants sh should, uh, not should, yeah, I think must follow <laughs> <laughs> our next meeting. Thank you for the staff and the resident. Doctor, have you uh, take the picture? Uh, maybe should I count first, Dr. Ferdi, okay, okay. so that everyone can be ready. Okay, yeah, please everyone can open the video camera so Dr. Ofida will uh, take the photos of us. Okay, uh, for the first um, screen, one, two, three. And for the second screen, one, two, three. Okay, it's done, Dr. Reddy. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Fida. Terima kasih banyak, Prof, untuk ilmu pengetahuan yang sudah di-sharingkan, dibagikan kepada kita, kepada murid-murid kita juga, dan kepada alumni, ya, serta para senior yang ada di sini. Kiranya ilmu ini dapat bermanfaat buat kita hari ini dan di masa yang akan datang. Terima kasih banyak sekali lagi, Prof. Selamat sore. And ya, yeah, terima kasih banyak. Kita bisa tutup ya, izin live ya, semua ya. Terima kasih. Hello everyone. Terima kasih.